We are connected. Perhaps you are viewing these images and hearing this audio on a computer. Or maybe you are using a tablet, or a mobile device, or are watching a large screen. Look around you. There may be wires connecting you to the Internet. Or you may be linked to this experience using wireless technology. Whether you are in Istanbul, Iceland, Indiana, or India, using your computer, your phone or your tablet. It's all the same. We are connected. How did this all come to be? That a network of signals and systems from around the world would bring all of our different devices together. Let's go back to the 1970s. Four decades ago, the computers of the day were not only significantly larger than our current machines, they were much slower. More importantly, none of them was linked to the Internet or each other. This would all change as the 1970s rounded into the early 1980s. Around this time, Bob Metcalf, the inventor of Ethernet, was among a group of individuals from the top computer companies in the world who wanted to make their products interoperable. The technology available to them at the time included Ethernet, just recently invented, and the earliest generations of local area networks, or LANs. Also available to them were different ways to work together. They could work in a membership-only organization or a standards development organization that is open to all. Ultimately, they decided to bring their project to IEEE to develop an open standard. They discussed and drafted performance requirements for Ethernet, specifying, for example, that it would work at 10 megabits per second. The IEEE family of 802 standards would explore and explain the related technology. Today we have Ethernet, we have wireless technology, and we have IEEE 802 standards that keep the technology alive and relevant. We are still moving, heading toward embedded microprocessor standards and toward standards for packet-based gigabit class services using Ethernet. These IEEE 802 standards connect us. By the nature of their interoperability, they make it possible for manufacturers and service providers to design, build, and operate a variety of products that work together. They allow us to work together. And they continue to evolve. Since the late 1970s, Ethernet has been invented and reinvented many, many times as the corresponding IEEE standards have been through numerous revisions. For example, in 2014, Ethernet speeds were up to 100 gigabits per second, and they are rapidly advancing toward terabits. Technical standards helped us get here, and they will help us reach the next level. This video is the second in a series designed to teach the basics of standards education. Our focus today is on how and why standards are developed, and by whom. We will explore the wide range of individuals, companies, and countries that create and use standards. We will also explore the different procedures that are used to generate standards, the protocols that affect not only the ever-changing and expanding global marketplace, but also our daily lives. Not everyone needs to understand all that is happening behind the scenes with our electronic devices and communication networks. Or ask why electronic devices run on specific voltages, how computers manage precise resources, or when network signal traffic should be directed to travel through wires or without wires. But someone has to. How standards developers arrive at and agree upon the levels of great precision detail or instruction included in standards does not happen overnight. 
nor does it happen on its own. Many years of research, debate, and revision go into standards development. This involves significant investment of time and potentially millions of dollars. Exactly how standards are developed depends upon the kind of standards that are being developed and at which standards organization. In the first video of this standards education series, we discussed de jure and de facto standards. De jure standards are developed by formal standards organizations using well-established procedures. De facto standards are technical specifications developed outside the formal processes that gain wide acceptance in the marketplace as a result of many organizations and individuals adopting them. The process of developing a de jure standard is facilitated by a standards development organization, an SDO, which offers time-tested platforms, rules, and even services to help facilitate the development, distribution, and maintenance of standards. Many SDOs around the world recognize the Standards Development Principles of the World Trade Organization, or WTO. WTO guidelines encourage SDOs not to create unnecessary obstacles to trade, and whenever appropriate, to specify requirements in terms of performance. Six additional principles emphasize that an SDO should also maintain transparency, openness, impartiality and consensus, effectiveness and relevance, coherence, and a development dimension. A number of leading global standards organizations support the principles of OpenStand. OpenStand principles are designed to foster competition and cooperation, support innovation and interoperability, and drive market success. The principles comprise a modern paradigm in which the economics of global markets, fueled by technological innovation, drive global deployment of standards, regardless of their formal status within traditional bodies of national representation. Standards developed and adopted via the open stand principles include IEEE standards for the Internet's physical connectivity, IETF standards for end-to-end -end global Internet interoperability, and the W3C standards for the World Wide Web. While the goals of all SDOs are very similar, each SDO applies its own rules, processes, and terminology to the standards development process. Typically, an SDO is made up of boards, committees, and staff who establish and maintain the policies, procedures, and guidelines that help ensure the integrity of the standards development process and the standards that are generated as an outcome of this process. In the case of de jure standards, the development of a new standard is triggered by a formal request to a selected SDO. The SDO reviews the technical merit and market applicability of the request. Once the SDO approves the request to develop a new standard, an associated technical committee assembles a collaborative team or working group to engage interested and qualified parties in active standards development. Working groups leverage established rules and guidelines in order to determine their own methods of communication, decision-making, balloting, and even financial reporting, all in accordance with SDO rules. To build consensus through democratic means, participants meet regularly, draft and review position pieces, examine data, and engage in active discussion and debate to resolve outstanding issues. Standards development participants bring to the table their own specific interests as producers, sellers, buyers, users, or regulators of particular materials, products, processes, or services. Their contributions fuel the gradual definition of a standard, which is compiled into a draft document that may undergo multiple revisions. Before a draft standard can be approved and published, it is sent out for a vote. Based on the percentage of balloters and the approval rates, the draft standard may be approved or sent around again for additional revisions. Ultimate approval of the finished standard is typically granted by the SDO's governance boards, which ensure that the process was followed correctly and fairly. Standards are living documents. This means that, even after they are published, they may be modified, corrected, adjusted, or updated based on market conditions and other factors. There are many different kinds of standards development organizations. They can be formal or informal, 
and they vary widely in terms of their participation, reach, and scope. For the purposes of categorization, standards development organizations can often be understood by their national, international, regional, or corporate focus. These definitions are expansive by nature, however, and evolve over time to meet social, political, and economic needs. There is one standard system with the organizations that follow a country-based model. In the country-based system, nearly every country in the world has a national standards body. There are differences in the levels of government affiliation and not all of them actually develop standards. In China, the national standards body is SAC, the Standardization Administration of the People's Republic of China. In India, it is BIS, the Bureau of Indian Standards. In Germany, the national standards body is DIN, the German Institute for Standardization. ANSI, the American National Standards Institute, is responsible for standards written for an American audience. ANSI standards often become national regulations that affect daily life in the United States and beyond, extending their reach both regionally and internationally. Many countries maintain standardization research institutes to direct national standardization strategy. The China National Institute of Standardization, or CNIS, is the sole national standardization research institute, and China's National Social Welfare, Scientific, and Research Institute. CNIS addresses strategic and comprehensive standardization issues for China's national economy and social development, and is responsible for researching and drafting comprehensive and basic standards and providing powerful standard information services. In addition to addressing issues specific to the residents of their countries, national standards bodies also represent their countries to the SDOs that allow national body membership and distribute voting rights accordingly, such as ISO, IEC, and ITU. ISO, the International Organization for Standardization, is a global network of national standards bodies that develop standards in partnership with the sectors that will put them to use, adopts them, based on national input and delivers them for implementation throughout the world. IEC is the International Electrotechnical Commission. In IEC, every member country, no matter how large or small, has one vote and a say in what goes into an IEC international standard. Over 10,000 experts from industry, commerce, government, labs, academia, and consumer groups participate in IEC standardization work. ITU, the International Telecommunication Union, is an international organization within the United Nations system where governments and the private sector coordinate global telecom networks and services. The ITU comprises three sectors, ITU-R, which handles radio communication, ITU-T, which is responsible for coordinating standards efforts, and ITUD, which concentrates on development. Regional standards organizations represent the interests of different geographic or economic regions of the world. Examples of regional SDOs include Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, or APEC, the European Committee for Standardization, or CEN, the European Committee for Electrotechnical Standardization, or CENELEC, and the African Organization for Standardization, or ARSO. Other SDOs, like IEEE, the Internet Society, IAB, the Internet Architecture Board, and IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force, are also global in their reach and scope, without country or regional representation. The interests of these industry and sector-based SDOs are borderless and driven by market and societal needs. These SDOs embrace an open, collective movement to radically improve the way people around the globe develop, deploy, and embrace technologies for the benefit of humanity. Standards consensus building at IEEE is coordinated by the IEEE Standards Association, known as IEEE SA. At IEEE SA, participation is not linked to country membership or national body representation. Rather, the overwhelming majority of IEEE standards are initiated, created, 
and maintained by individuals from more than 160 different countries who have a variety of technical needs and requirements. These diverse needs are addressed according to IEEE SA's methodical and fair governance. IEEE SA also employs a separate entity standards development process for standards that are sponsored by entities, such as corporations, governments, nonprofits, or associations. Entity projects are governed by the rules that help to ensure that no one interest, company, or organization dominates the standards development process. Standards are also developed by industry consortia, including the World Wide Web Consortium, or W3C, whose standards for HTML, CSS, and XML are used throughout the world, and the Accelera Systems Initiative, an independent, not-for-profit organization that develops standards for use by the worldwide electronics industry. There are also community-driven associations such as the IETF, a worldwide network of volunteers who collaborate to set standards for lower-level software solutions. Even with the prevalence of national, regional, and international standards available, some companies may still choose to use their own internal standards, which they develop exclusively for their staff and customers. These corporate standards, which are considered proprietary, can either be closed or open. A closed proprietary standard is a format, technology, or method that is developed and used by a single company wishing to protect its intellectual property and trade secrets. Closed proprietary standards are fast to evolve, well-supported, and targeted towards solutions. However, they are also defined by discriminatory access, market constriction, and diminished interoperability. Open proprietary standards are also controlled by a single company, which owns the intellectual property and the standards, yet they are accessible to anyone who wishes to use them. With open proprietary standards, consumers realize the benefits of interoperability, suppliers can sell products into new markets, and the standards owner can choose to profit from the asset. The evolution of these open proprietary standards and the cost of using them, however, depends upon a single company. Whether a standard is national, international, regional, or corporate, we can be assured that a great deal of work and time went into developing it. From idea to publication, the steps of the process are well established. Within this complexity, however, there is a way for individuals, companies, and organizations to find, or create, the precise standards that fit their needs. As an industry leader or engineering professional, you too will find standards to be tools of your trade. Standards provide a common language for all stakeholders, the public, governments, manufacturers, businesses, consumers, and educators. Standards development is driven by these different stakeholders. Governments establish initiatives for the development of standards in order to demonstrate social responsibility and to take active measures to ensure the safety of individuals and communities. Manufacturers establish standards to make it easier for consumers to understand and compare competing products. Only through the use of standards can requirements for interconnectivity and interoperability be ensured and the credibility of new products and new markets verified, enabling the rapid implementation of new technology. International business markets require standards to define accepted practices of trade. The globalization of markets will continue to emphasize the economic component of standardization and the demand for a balanced approach to the development and use of standards across regions. Global markets require globally relevant standards. Industries need standards to help lower the costs of products and services and the related implementation, training, and acceptance. At the same time that they encourage innovation, standards establish compatibility and interoperability for consumers. When companies develop standards that speed the time to market for new products, they are helping reduce the risk of product liability for themselves and consumers. Because standards are so important in industry, industry wants new engineers to know about standards. Educators more and more are incorporating standards education into their curricula. 
Additional information about standards is available from SDOs as well. In the 1970s and 1980s, standards were developed by individuals who relied on paper, printouts, travel, and shipping services. Today, standards development takes place using Internet tools, including virtual communities and electronic communication. These tools will bring about faster standards development and more efficient use and implementation of standards. Standards will not only be a part of the future, they will help to shape it. New engineers are encouraged to learn more. Contact IEEE or other standards development organizations for more information and to begin your own journey with standards development. <laughs>